So this is a quote from Gemara. In Hebrew, it's Meshus, Kashem, Sikonius, Nikalu, have a Seder in Mitzrayim. I have a moment to get the more copies of this. Maybe another five copies of this. Yeah, another five copies of this. Even ten. ten. Yeah. In the merit of the righteous women, we went out of Mitzrayim. That's the first page in this book. So, I want to go over the main points of the Sikhim. Have they ever spoke about this subject? And that's, uh, just turn the page. We don't have page numbers here, but there's page numbers of this 111. This is Sikha the Rebbe gave, 1992. It's one of the last Sikhs where he spoke about the subject. And let's read it together. In every generation, it was in the merit of the righteous women that the Jewish people were redeemed. What does that mean? Is it a source that says not only in Egypt, but in every generation, when there was any kind of crisis, does everybody know where I'm holding or still not? This is right, the first yeah, yeah, yeah. page. Okay. Yeah, this is book. Is it the wrong book? Oh, it should be eight to fifteen. So this is the talk that Rabbi gave Parshas Boy, the Shalach, Tavshim Beis, nineteen ninety two. That in every generation, not only in Egypt, but in even the following generations, whenever there was a crisis of sorts, the Jewish people, and they were able to be saved from that crisis, it was always in the merit of the Jewish women. And one of the things that I pointed out about the, why the women, that the, you know, that the Abishta created all of us with different strengths and different weaknesses. The strength of a woman is more in the area of Amuna. And when it comes to faith in Hashem and trust in Hashem, women are superior to men. And he goes on to say the following. One of the innovations of the Rebbe, my father-in-law, leader of the generation, the Bali Lul of Yutshvat, the Rebbe was speaking about this on Yutshvat, that's the day of passing of the previous Rebbe, was his activity and devotion to motivate Jewish women and girls regarding Torah and mitzvahs, and especially to learn Hasidus. I mentioned this the other day, that there was a time where no one studied Hasidus. Then there was a time where only selected individuals studied Hasidus. Then there came a time where it became open for everyone, but still women weren't studying Hasidus. In 1933, that was the first time that the previous Rebbe opened that door and he encouraged women to also study Hasidus and that women should take on positions of leadership and spreading Yiddishkeit in their communities. His activities emphasize distinguishing eminence of Jewish women, each as a mainstay of her home that is, it is within her strength and ability that besides the fact that she's a mother to her children and her family that influence all members of the household, including sons and husbands, they have that power that they could inspire everyone else around them. The source for this is explained in a well-known talk regarding the precedence of women before the men in vital matters concerning Jewish people. So there are three areas where we find in the Torah that the Torah gives precedence, and the Torah says that women were superior to men in these three areas. What are the three areas? One is Matan Torah. When the Torah was given, the Pasuk says, in Hebrew, it's Kais Seymar El Beis Yaakov, the Saged of Bnei Yisrael. Speak to the house of Jacob and speak to the children of Israel. So the Gemara says, when it says the house of Jacob, it means the women. When it says the children of Israel, it means to the men. Basically, speak to the women and speak to the men. But it says, speak to the women first, and then it says, speak to the men. The Rebbe doesn't explain it here, but the Gemara explains 
that the first commandment ever in history was the commandment not to eat from the Eitz Hadas, from the tree in Gan Eden. Who did Hashem give the commandment to? Adam or Chava? Adam. And then Chava found out about it. What happened? Bad news. Failed. He ate, she ate, they brought into this world the opposite of life. So Hashem said, this time I'm going to do it differently. First I'll speak to the women and then to the men. And if I speak to the women first and they'll be stronger, then I know that the men will also be strong. So it means the Torah is giving strength when it comes to Matan Torah, it's speak to the women and if they're going to be strong, everyone will be strong. That's one thing. Then we talk about the Mishkan, the sanctuary in the, in the Midbar. It says in the Chumash, you should build for me a sanctuary and I will dwell there. As it's written, and it says, and the men brought their gifts, let's turn the page, after the women. In other words, the women came first and then the men followed. In addition to their precedence and time, the women were there first in essence and in excellence. In other words, the women were superior to the men in two areas. One area is that they were they were sort of more uh, enthusiastic and they were they were quicker to bring donations for the Mishkan before the men. In other words, chronologically, they came first. And the second thing is they they invested more of themselves into the Mishkan. How do we know this? We'll look a little bit later. We'll see. Another thing at Matan Torah. Where do we see the women were superior? The women did not wish, neither did they give of their gold to create the golden calf. Unwilling to be partners in a sin, opposing Matan Torah, joyfully choosing rather to give their gold for the building of the Mishkan. In other words, not only did Hashem speak to the women first and then to the men, it means the women chronologically came first, but the women also showed more strength. We know that when Hashem gave the Torah to the Jews, Shortly after, they worshipped the golden calf, which is the opposite of Matan Torah. And as a result of that, there was also so much negativity. The women were not partners to giving gold for the golden calf. So it means that also spiritually, and not just in time, but in, in the quality of their devotion, dedication to Torah, women were more than men. And the women were able to overcome that test. Where do we find by the Mishkan, by the sanctuary, that women were more than men in terms of quality? It says, and all the women wove the wool for the curtains on the goats. The, the donations that they brought was money, but they also brought material for different things. One of the things in the Mishkan was there were a lot of curtains. So the women wove the curtains. Weaving is a certain skill and a certain art. But they did something out of the ordinary. What was it? <clears throat> they wove the curtains on the goats, which means this was their specialty, that they spun the wool while it was still attached to the backs of the goats. This is nothing that harmed the goats or caused them any kind of pain, but it was a, uh, a, a greater way of spinning the wool for the base of English. We'll soon see why. And that's what it means that all the women spun the goats, Rashi comments. This was their craft specialty. In other words, a special gift that they had that they were able to spin it while it was still on the goats. What's the advantage of that? A, B, C, three, three advantages. Number one, by doing that, it retains its brilliance rather than losing its quality by being uprooted from its source. Once it's cut off, it just wasn't as, as good as when it's still on the goats when it has life to it. So that's one thing, why they did it that way. Thank you very much. The second thing is B, also the wool could not become impure while it's still attached to the living animal. We know that in the base of English, everything had to be pure. You weren't allowed to bring in impurity there. An, a live animal doesn't become impure, but an object could become impure. So by giving the wool, by, by doing the weaving of the wool while, the goat, while it's still on the goats, it didn't even have the potential to become impure because it's still part of a living animal. The third reason that's given is that this gift to the base of English was of a greater quality because we know that the world is divided into four categories. Daymen, 
Tzemeach, Chai, and Medaba. There's the human kingdom, the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, and then there is inanimate, things that have no life whatsoever. In these four kingdoms, naturally, the uh, animal kingdom is higher than the plant kingdom. But if, so if they give the, um, <clears throat> if they cut off the wool and then they weave it and give it as a gift, they're giving a gift from something which has no life, inanimate. When they weave it on the thing, they're giving a gift to something that has greater quality. It's something that has life because it's still part of a living animal. So it's from the animal kingdom. So that's in the base of Mexico. These are three areas where we see that women were superior to men. One is in their enthusiasm to receive the Torah. One was in their enthusiasm to bring the, the gifts for the base of Mikdash. And then the Gula, their special connection to Gula at, at this time. Furthermore, and at this time, this is the main point, their special connection to Gula, our sages tell us, as a reward to the righteous women of that generation, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. That it was in their schus. And again, one of the things that was their schus, that the men were weak and they were lacking in their faith and belief that it's really going to happen. The women were very strong. The women were absolutely convinced and had total faith that they're going out of Mitzrayim. And not only that, we know that the women were so sure that this is going to happen that they prepared tambourines, musical instruments, because they were sure we're soon going to see incredible miracles and we'll be dancing and singing for the miracles that we went out of Egypt this is before they went out. They already prepared. So that means the women were strong in their amuna. This is also true of the future Gula. It says, in the days of your exodus from Egypt, I will show you wonders. So being that it says, I will show you wonders, like the days of Egypt means not just, and we mentioned this the other day, not just that just like we saw wonders then, we'll see wonders now, but also the kind of wonders, the kind of miracles. Again, to connect it to current events, one of the miracles that happened before the Jews went out of Egypt was the Maka Mitzrayim Yukharayim. What does that mean? The Shabbos before, the, what day in the week did the Jews go out of Egypt? Anybody know? I know it's hard to remember things that happened 3,300 years ago. They went out on a what did you say? Thursday. Thursday, Thursday right. Thursday. Oh, they went out of Thursday, but something major happened on, on Shabbos before. In fact, that's why every year the Shabbos before Pesach has a special name. It's called the Big Shabbos to commemorate the big miracle. What was the big miracle? The last plague was the firstborn of Egypt will, be, will die. So Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses came to Paro and said, if you don't let the Jews out, this plague is going to happen. They saw already the first plague, the second, the third, all the nine plagues were fulfilled. That means this one will also happen. So the firstborn in Egypt got themselves organized without, without uh, using the internet. Somehow they were able to get together and they came together and made a big demonstration, a protest, demanding of Paro to let the Jews go because if not, they're all going to die. Paro was not concerned. And he said, I'm not letting them out. So they started a war. And in that war, many of the Egyptians were killed. But we're not talking about people being killed. We have to remember that going out of Egypt wasn't just a physical, technical thing. We're slaves and we're being confined or being persecuted. And going out means we have freedom. That's true. But there was something much deeper going on. Paro and Egypt represented the essence of clip of impurity in that generation. And the Jewish people were held captive by that force. So we have a, much, a mission to learn Torah, to do mitzvahs, to serve Hashem, and we couldn't do and live our life the way we want because we're being held captive by this impure force. So really the, the war here was between purity and impurity, between holiness and evil. And going out of Egypt represented the so-called liberation that 
holiness was liberated from the captivity that it was in the, the unholy place. Here the miracle was not only that holiness was able to defeat unholiness, but Egypt itself, in Egypt itself, the clip itself destroyed the force of the clip. Because that Shabbos, when the war took place, that was sort of what broke the strength of Egypt. And a few days later, they went out of Egypt completely. So that's called Lamake Mitzrayim B'Chareim, that Egypt was beaten by their own firstborn, by their own people. That's what we're seeing now also. <clears throat> what I'm saying is what happened in Syria. As you know, you've been hearing the last few days, and if you probably read anything about the news, you see that Syria is not just a country that we had a problem with. Syria is considered, and, and now looking back more and more, it's more clear that Syria was like a centerpiece in everything that's going on in the Middle East, opposing Israel. It brought together Iran, Iraq, and, and, and the Hezbollah, and all these terrorists, all connected to Syria. And therefore, once this was broken, Hezbollah lost its power, Iran lost its power, and Syria is not lost its power, it lost its existence as a regime. It doesn't exist anymore. So who did it? Who did it? The rebels did it, which means they themselves destroyed the force of Klippa. So that's very similar to what happened then. And not only that, but many details are pointed out that the way it happened then, something similar will happen now. So being that then, it was the women that brought the redemption. So now also it'll be the righteous women are the ones who will bring the redemption. And I guess that's the reason why the Rebbe himself gave so much power, so much strength, and so much encouragement to women. And now we have literally thousands of women that are shluchas around the world. And that's because the key to redemption is in the hands of the women. What? Chabad Damasik, yeah. They opened the Chabad house there. This is especially true taking into account the Kabbalistic writings of the Arizal. What does he write? Those living at the time of the future redemption, which are, which are, which are our generation, have the souls, which means we are a reincarnation of the souls who left Egypt. Accordingly, if that's the case, then righteous women of our generation are in whose merit we will be redeemed are the very righteous women of that generation. So if you feel that you somehow recognize each other, that's why it is, because you all were in trying together. And all the Neshamas were the ones that took that in their merit, they didn't win out of Mitzrayim. So this is something that I've emphasized a lot. And for that reason, uh, that I've emphasized to give women um, as much education and women's yeshivas, the Rebbe gave a lot of attention to this kind of yeshiva. And I, I think when this first was established, the Rebbe said a yeshiva like this for women is even more important than for men. Because the women, they're the ones who are the, they're sort of the anchor and they're the foundation of the home. But especially in view of Mashiach, is the women that have to bring Mashiach. So they have to be strengthened spiritually. There's more to the Sikha, but I'll leave that for maybe another time. I'll go on to number nine. You turn the page, is number nine. The need to shout out to Hashem, we want Mashiach now at Masa. So in the first class that we gave, we spoke about the fact that the Rebbe always spoke about Mashiach, but as the years moved on, the uh, the uh, talk about Mashiach, the awareness of Mashiach, the emphasis on Mashiach became progressively more and more intense. One point where it took a major turn was in 1980. 1980. In Hebrew, it was Tavshin Mem Aluf, which is 5741. And what was it? At that point, the Rebbe said that we have to call out to Hashem, scream out to Hashem, and say these words, Ad Hashem, how much longer will we be kept from Golis? Which means we have to ask Hashem and, and plead with him and beg with him and pray that we should go out of, out of, out of Golis. <clears throat> At the time, this had a lot of, uh, it was very controversial and there was a lot of opposition, even though you think to yourself, what could be opposition? 
to asking Hashem for bringing Moshiach. So if you turn to the next page, I'm just going to point out a few of the questions that we're going to discuss. First of all, number one, why is it necessary to cry out at Masai? At Masai in Hebrew means until when, basically, Hashem, how long are you going to keep us in Golis? What's the question? The question is we daven every day. In davening, we ask Hashem to go out of Golis. What do we have to, in addition to that, uh, say it in English and Yiddish and Hebrew and French and Russian and, and, and different languages and asking Hashem in addition to the davening, why isn't it enough what we say in davening? That's number one. <clears throat> number two, people ask, I guess two and three are pretty similar. Aren't the words Ad Masai too strong? When you say Ad Masai, it sounds like you're saying to Hashem, how long are you going to keep us here? It's, it sounds like we are being speaking in a much, too much of an aggressive way. We're speaking to Hashem. We should say, please, Hashem, you have a moment to think about us. Please get us out of here. Ad Masai is, is a strong language. We want Mashiach now. It sounds like demanding it's a strong language. And that go, that's number one. It, it, maybe it's inappropriate to speak like that to Hashem. Number three, isn't it disrespectful to Hashem to demand Mashiach? Why? <clears throat> Doesn't Hashem know best the right time? If we're saying, and especially in a strong language, I'm demanding that you take us out of Golos, it's as if Hashem doesn't know when the right time is. This was the question. I'm not making up these questions. These are the questions that people wrote. People criticized. That is the wrong thing to do. Number four, wouldn't it be better to use the term asking rather than demanding? Again, this is pretty much similar. Demanding is very strong. Number five, if everything Hashem does is for the good, and that's the way we're supposed to be seeing things, no matter what happens, that see that really it's good, but it's camouflaged, it's hidden good, why don't we apply the same principle to Golis? Which means we're making a commotion to get out of Golis. If Hashem has us in Golis, it must be it must be good. We don't see it, okay, so we don't understand. But Hashem, in His infinite wisdom, sees that it's a good thing. So why are we making a commotion? Number six, <clears throat> the Rebbe actually wanted that people should say it in English. And the Rebbe himself, who doesn't usually speak English publicly, when he has a gathering with would sing in English, we want Mashiach now, and people should sing it in their language. What was that all about? Why was it necessary? If everything else is in Yiddish or in Hebrew, why was it necessary? This should be said in English. Another question people have, why does it say loudly? What's wrong with reciting it softly? Which means, just like we daven, to say, we want Mashiach now. Why have to say it so loud? People sometimes interpret the loudness as if you're trying to force it on somebody and force it on me, people in the room. Why can't we just be quiet? Why, do we, why does it have to be said loud? Number eight, I think that's the same question as number one. So we won't make really, really, it's not different. It means why isn't davening enough? Why do we have to add at Mosse? Number nine, must we say this every day at every, in other words, it's very often people get together. They get together at a wedding. They get together at a bar mitzvah. They get together at a bat mitzvah. They get together at a bris. They get together at a pidyon aben. There's always be something about, we want Mashiach now. Why is that? Why can't we just say it once a day? Why do we have to do it all the time? It sounds like a little bit of an obsession. And number 10 is really the main question. Why is Gala such a devastating thing? As if without Gaula, life is unbearable. I'll explain my question. Years ago, Jews were persecuted in almost in every country that they lived. Jews were limited in almost every country that they lived. lived. They had certain limitations. There were certain countries where you couldn't even live in the same neighborhood as other people. There were ghettos. Jews have to live in a separate place. And there were countries where Jews didn't have the same privileges like everybody else. Some of the privilege they did have was to pay extra taxes, but they couldn't go to colleges, universities. They couldn't have certain professional positions. Wherever they lived, all the countries in Europe, most of them had all these limitations. We're living now in a time 
where relatively Yiddishkeit is free, free. We could practice Yiddishkeit wherever you want. Even Russia today, you can practice Yiddishkeit out in the open. Yes, there are people here and there that are anti-Semites, but in general, governments and the rules that governments put down all allow Jews all the privileges like any other citizen. So it means I can have any business I want. I can have any profession I want. I can study Torah. I can wear my beard and tzitzis in the street. And it's, it's really a time of, of also good and plenty. Many Jews, years ago, Jews lived a lot in poverty. Today, some of the Jews are extremely wealthy, uh, wealthier than others. So Baruch Hashem, there's money, there's fists and material, there's spiritual. Okay, we want Mashiach, but what, by screaming and, and being so obsessed, it makes it sound as if it's devastating if Mashiach doesn't come. What's so devastating? One of the things that just happened was that um, Israel took over a mountain in Syria, the Har Khermon. Strategically, it's, an, it's a very, very important strategic location. And we have the Golan Heights. But at the time when there was a war going on between Israel and Syria, there was a big debate that all, most of the people, the government, which we call the left, were against and said, give back the Golan Heights. All other countries, the United Nations said, give back the Golan Heights. The Rebbe's opinion was, don't give back one inch. First of all, it belongs to us. And second of all, strategically, it can make a difference between life and the opposite. This is a tremendous strategic place. So at the time, there was someone who was actually a, not only a religious Jew, but a leader amongst a certain groups, religious Haredi leader. And he was against it. He joined all the others that said to give back the Golden Heights. And the statement he made publicly was, as Jews lived without the Golden Heights for 2,000 years, they can live another 2,000 years without the Golden Heights. Nothing will happen. The Rebbe said, if you analyze the statement, what he's basically saying, we live for 2,000 years in Golas, we can live another 2,000 years in Golas. He didn't mean to say we should be suffering. He meant to say, thank God, we have a good life, especially in Israel. Like I said before, we have all the privileges uh, we have everything we need. We have yeshivas for men, yeshivas for women. Uh, um, so many people have money and they're supporting others and there's so much stuck and so many good deeds. We're learning Torah. So we don't have a piece of land. Is that the end of the world? So what's the answer to all these questions? Okay. No, our time is not up. We can start explaining it. Maybe we should start with this with this question first. Anyone want to suggest what the answer would be? In other words, imagine a world where, thank God, we're not, let's say the Arabs stop attacking us now. So look at all the countries in the world. And even in Israel now, let's say there's no more terrorism. Let's say there's no more terrorism. So, what, I mean, of course, Mashiach, Based on should be beautiful. So is that devastating? You won't be able to bring the sacrifice? Yeah. Um, if there was interesting as any trying to take over the But I'm saying, what if it wouldn't be that way? Jews would learn Torah, do mitzvahs, be kind wouldn't. to each other. What? But they wouldn't because before they, they weren't this these all these years they haven't. Everyone's mm -hmm. like their society has changed and generation has been more in Gallus, more like difficult challenges in this day. So if it if if we actually won just now and everything went to normal and we go back to the same way as before. So you're saying Gallus means that we're being we have certain challenges. Mashiach comes means there won't be any challenges. Okay. Because he actually wants to wake us up. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else want to say anything um, similar? I, what? The question is, what would be so devastating? 
if all the countries would be like those free countries that you know, like we have in North America, South America, where people can live freely as Jews, do Torah, do mitzvahs, and uh, do acts of kindness to one another, be openly in the street free, have all the privileges of everybody else. Only thing is, we don't have a base on English. We're not living in Israel. What, would that be so devastating? Or it means we're missing some extra, you know, uh, extra luxuries. But is it like devastating? What do you want to say? Well, is there question number one? Yeah. Hi. It's really question number 10, but it's connected to question number one. It's connected I think to all that, the questions. Yeah. Like, Hashem is hope, hope is that we cry. Because it's not like the Mashiach comes like Yoreda. The... Like, no. Right, we have to do something to make it happen. Yeah. But I'm asking you a question. What would be so terrible? Makol kav garua im Yehakov b'seder yesh to kol echad v'echad ma lechol l'bosh bayit ashirut ruchniyut v'gashmiyut v'aval ein lanu et ha beit hamikdash ze kol kach nora. Okay, okay, lana shechina k'mo galul. Okay, yes. What do you want to say? It's so devastating because. So is that so devastating that we we only have we have six hundred thirteen and we can only do half of that? Okay, so let, so let you're right, and you're right, and you're right. Let me now explain it all together. I always think of, of a story that once happened where I was speaking to a couple that were having an issue getting along, and I asked the wife to present, you know, what's going on. So she says that her husband works, gets home, he finishes work every day at five o'clock, but he doesn't get home until six o'clock. And some days, he stays later, comes home seven o'clock. Some days he comes home nine o'clock. Some days he comes home 10 o'clock. Some days he doesn't come home, comes home the next day. He's out with his friends. So I say to him, you know, you always have to hear both sides of the story. I say to him, what do you say? He said, I never heard of such a thing in my life that once you get married, you have to disassociate with all your friends. So I said, we're not talking about disassociating, but I mean, if this is your wife and this is your family, I think uh, once you finish with work, you come home. Of course, people go out and have time with their friends. But what, what do you mean you don't come home at all? So he turns to her and says, what are you complaining about? You have food in the fridge. You have a car in the driveway. The kids are going to school. You're paying tuition. You have this, you have that, you have this. What are you complaining about? So she says, I have all these things, but I don't have you. Like, you're not part of this marriage. If a marriage is a relationship between two people, so what are you telling me? I have meat to eat, and I have bread to eat, and I have a coat, and the children have coats, and they're going to... It's all beautiful, but where are you in the picture? And that's the same thing with Hashem. Our relation with Hashem, with the Shekhinah, is like husband and wife. Right? Hashem is like the husband, where they're the wife. All of Yiddishkeit, everything is about me and Hashem, becoming one, the Jewish people and Hashem becoming one. So therefore, to say, I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other thing is beautiful, but where's Hashem? He's totally hidden from us. Like you said, the Shekhinah is hidden. And if the Shekhinah is hidden, it's in a sense the essence of what Judaism is all about is lacking. When we say Mashiach comes, the base of English will be built, or we'll have sacrifices, or we'll have more mitzvahs, these are the details, but what's really happening is it's going to change that the Shekhinah will be revealed. And because the Shekhinah will be revealed, that's why we'll have a base Amigdash, and that's why everything will be good. Or like you said, we won't have it. that's why we won't have any challenges. Because once the Shekhinah is revealed, there won't be any more challenges. But the essence of that coming of Mashiach is all about Hashem being revealed. So this will be equivalent to a woman who would have the money in the bank, and she has a car, and she has a pays rent, Everything is there, but her husband is lost somewhere. He's gone, and she would be devastated. 
the God forbid, if that would happen. And that's what we're, that's what means that we cry out to Hashem, we ask for Admasa, that we want Hashem to be revealed to us. So when we say that, that uh, when we say such long words, Hashem at Mosai, and people say, isn't that a little bit disrespectful? That not only is it not disrespectful, when we do that, that's sweet music to Hashem's ears. We're basically saying to Hashem, Hashem, we, want, we don't want to be without you. So that's not a negative, that's a positive. Think of it, as we said before, in a relationship. If something went on and the husband and wife separated, and someone's trying to reconciliate, bring them back. If one party who wants to get back again, and they don't know where the other party is holding, and they hear from the other, other party that I want you back and I can't live without you, that for them is going to be the, the most pleasant thing that they want to hear. Basically, Hashem wants to hear from us that we can be without Him and His presence. So when we say Ad Masai, and that's the answer to the question, why do we say it out loud? It's not about saying it loud. It's about saying it in a way that we're self telling Hashem that this is something urgent. This is something very, very urgent. That we and not just it's an additional luxury to our lives, but our lives are lacking in a major way unless we have you in our relationship. It's interesting, there's a very interesting um, analogy given by the Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim was someone who lived in the previous generation, and he spoke a lot, a lot about Mashiach. He published books and letters on the subject of Mashiach. In fact, his whole campaign about not speaking Lashon Hara was to bring Mashiach sooner. So he says something very interesting. There's a halacha that if someone you do work for someone and you make up that you're going to pay me at the end of the week and they don't pay you, they violated a commandment. The Torah says, do not delay the payment of a worker. Or let's say at the end of the day, if they make up, I'll pay you at the end of the day and you don't pay. And the other person wants to get paid. If they make up, you can hold the money, pay me when you have money. That's okay. But if they make up, you'll pay me at the end of the day and I don't want to pay you at the end of the day. I have violated a commandment. So the, so the Chavetz Chaim says, we should say to Hashem, you know, we worked. Now you have to give us our reward. You're telling us the reward will be when Mashiach comes. No, we want the reward now. because You have to pay us right away. But then he adds one thing. The halacha is, it's only considered a violation if the worker demands of his employer to pay him. If he doesn't ask him to pay him, then it doesn't, it's not a good thing, but it does, it's not, it, then it doesn't apply that it's an absolute violation. So he says the same as with Hashem. Hashem is our employer. We're doing the work. We need to get the reward. But when is it strong? When we actually ask for it. So therefore, he writes, we should be emphasizing to Hashem, not just in davening, but also additional time in Hashem. We want you to bring Mashiach, which in different words mean, we want you to reward us for all the things we did in the time of Gullus. So let's go through some of the questions. Why is it necessary to cry out at Masai? This is the reason. Uh, the question was, why do we say it? Why isn't davening enough? Davening is something which is a text we say every day. And we say the words, we repeat it. It could become like, a, what's the word? Routine, you know, say every day. When you say it after davening, and you call out Hashem in our own words. And that's why we should say it in English, in Spanish, in Russian, in French, in different languages. The same language that I speak on a daily basis, then it's something more personal. I'm showing Hashem. I'm not just saying the words because it's in the tefillah, but I really want you to bring, to, to, to reveal yourself and to come to us. And the same thing with the question number nine. Why must we say this every day? And again, I think we can use the example of what's happening now in Israel, where unfortunately many families have family members that are being held hostage. Every opportunity they have, they ask people, could you say a prayer, a bracha, what we have to do something. They, they think about this constantly. And no, no one's going to say, 
I'm going to finish soon, but we're having the class down here because upstairs it's a little bit cold. Maybe a little bit a lot, but it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> Every opportunity that a person has, a mother or a husband or a wife that their family member that they love is held hostage, they will, they won't forget about it for a second. No one's going to say, come on, you're a little bit too obsessed with this. And what do you mean obsessed? This is my son, God forbid. This is my daughter, this is my father, it's my mother, my husband, my wife. Yes, I'm obsessed. This is, I, I want them to come back. That's the way we have to feel about Mashiach. And if you look at it that way, then it explains all these questions. There's more things here I want to show you. I guess we'll continue next week. In Hashem. Everybody have a great Shabbos. Oh. So Thank you. Good, good Shabbos, Rabbi Majeski. Thank you. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Good Good Shabbat. Rabbi Majeski, thank you. We want Mashiach now, true. <laughs> we want Mashiach now. Uh -huh. Okay. What is that? <laughs> this is a single apple peel, ladies and gentlemen, that I peeled with a knife by wow. hand. She's a true boy. We're going to go far into the chest. This means I'm ready to go. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? Nothing easy, Walker.